Welcome back guys. I'm in the garden today and I have an awesome video. I am going to share with you my first ever garden tour and I'm going to show you guys what I am growing to feed our family for the year. So come along with me. I'll give you a little overview of the gardens and just kind of explain a few things and then we'll go item by item and I'll try to tell you the varieties and the things that I'm going to be doing with those. Is it Jet up there? I'll just wait. Still, still flying. There he goes. Anyways, let's go take a closer look. Okay, so here is an overview of my garden areas. Today we're going to focus on the vegetable garden. I do have other garden areas on this property, but we're going to just focus on these two gardens here for today. You can see over here I have an in-ground garden, and that is about 70 feet long by about 50 feet wide. And then next to that, the main garden is all raised beds. There's 52 raised beds in there. Most of them are four by eights, some are six by threes, and there's some other varying sizes in this garden. And this one is about 100 feet long by about 50 feet deep. So let's go on in and look at some of the beds and talk about what we're gonna be growing and preserving. Now I do really quickly want to preface this garden video with letting you know that the garden does not always look as nice and tidy as it does today. We have just finished the irrigation and so we had to bring a bunch of extra mulch down to the garden in order to cover up all of the PVC piping that's bringing water into each of the beds to that drip irrigation. So right now it looks really fresh and tidy but <laughs> this isn't how it typically looks. And once harvest season comes in, it won't look nearly as nice, I promise. <laughs> Okay, so first we're going to start talking about these metal beds here right in the center of the garden. These are six by three foot beds and these are all from Northern Tool. I've had these for about three years now and they have held up beautifully. I really love these for a quick, easy, simple um, garden bed to put together. They're not as deep as my other beds, but they work great for a lot of crops. So here you can see I have some spinach, which really just needs to be pulled. It's really too hot here in South Carolina. I'm in the upstate state area zone 7b and so I may let one or two of those go to seed but these most likely will come out and I will replace that with another crop on the other side here I have some beets and I like to preserve these by dehydrating them and powdering them and then we add them into smoothies soups and it just adds in so many nutrients um, that nobody knows is there we also like to pickle these in sort of a sweet pickle and then just eat them fresh on our salads we have a little bit of parsley there I did not have fantastic luck this year starting parsley so I'll have to do more of that in the fall and that will actually overwinter here and then a zinnia in my next bed this beautiful plant is called purple basil and we love to make tea from this and in fact this one right here is also the same variety but it's speckled I've never had one come out like that but this one did and I think it's beautiful but I call this nature's Gatorade when we make tea from it because it's just so refreshing um, it's really amazing and my kids love it so I would much rather have them drink purple basil tea with uh, raw honey than I would a Gatorade when we are out here in the summertime and sweating. Here we have a little bit of anise. Um, my main thing with that is I really wanted to try to candy it like the Indian restaurants do because it's so yummy but I only had one that took and so I don't think I'll meet that goal this year. And then we have some dill for our pickling needs this year. We also have some more beets here. And then I have some of your normal culinary basil. It's called Genovese basil with some Swiss chard in the back. And this plant here is actually kind of interesting. So last night I was down here and I originally had pulled this plant out because I thought that it was a weed. And when I pulled it out, I noticed that it actually came out with my soil mix on it. And so I figured, hey, I must have planted that. So I replanted it and since then it's grown a little bit bigger. And last night I pulled up an app on my phone just to see what this thing is, because I had no idea. And it's actually part of the nightshade family, which is the family that has white potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, but this is called American nightshade and it's actually highly poisonous. And if it's ingested, it can actually kill you. <laughs> so I have to get rid of this. Um, 
I, I just found that out last night, so I did tell my kids no one's going to touch this. Um, but yeah, I have to get rid of that. And my only thought is, is that it came in the seed packet with my eggplant. So, hmm, it's kind of interesting to think about why that might have been in there. But anyways, I digress. Let's move on. In my next bed, I have a couple of plants of sugar cube melon. Originally, I planted a bunch of these. They're like a cantaloupe. They're very sweet, two to three pounds, and they're just delicious. And so I said, hey, I'm only going to plant one type of cantaloupe this year so that I can seed save from these and I won't worry about cross-pollination. Well, what I forgot was that this variety is a hybrid, and so I won't be able to seed save there. A little mistake, um, but I'll just have to deal with it and seed save next year. Now, down in this bed, I'm really excited about these. I think I planted them too close together, but this is a globe artichoke. So if you've ever been in the grocery store and seen those round artichokes, um, they're also the type of artichokes that you would get artichoke hearts from. Uh, so I'm really excited about these. My mother used to make a recipe where you would stuff the leaves full of breadcrumbs and olive oil and salt and pepper and raisins. A lot of people don't like raisins and things, but in this particular recipe, it's delicious. So I'm excited to see what these do this year for us. Here is some more basil. And I will tell you a great way to preserve basil is to take a ton of the leaves and blend it up with olive oil. Then put that mixture, and it's going to be really thick, into ice cube trays and freeze those in the freezer. And then anytime that you're making a recipe where you want fresh basil, you just toss this into the recipe. And man, it's just a great way to preserve that original flavor that you're getting straight out of the garden. So I highly recommend that. I also dry this, but you kind of lose a bit of the flavor when you dry it. This little plant here is called a lemon yellow squash. It's a type of summer squash. And what's really nice about this variety is that it's pretty resistant to the squash bugs and the vine borers, and it's very prolific. So you get a lot off of this. Now with this particular type of summer squash, I like to slice them thinly or grate them. I put them on my dehydrator trays and dehydrate them, and then I save them in mason jars. And then when I'm making any kind of a soup, like a chicken noodle soup, or a turkey soup, or anything like that, I can throw that right in there, and it really is delicious. Over here I have some chamomile. It, <laughs> it was harvested earlier in the day, and you can see it's kind of looking a little sad. Um, chamomile really doesn't like the heat down here um, during the summer. So, so this plant is just um, probably on its way out, but I do have some more that are planted and we'll see if they, if they come up. But we really love the flowers for this, for salves, for like a calming lotion, and also in teas. Over here, I have some watermelon. I believe that this might be a crimson sweet watermelon or a sugar baby watermelon. I did not do great at labeling things this year and so now I'm paying for it. <laughs> Okay, so on the other side of these raised beds, I've got some zucchini growing, and that I preserve just like that lemon yellow squash. We also eat that fresh with hummus, and then we also like to saute that up and bread it and fry it, and that's really delicious. There is some lemon yellow squash in here, and then this plant is a butternut squash, and you can see one growing right there. Um, these guys are doing great. I don't think the vine borers have been out this year. I haven't seen any. But usually when I do, they're usually already into the plants, and then I have to dig them out and <laughs> fix everything from that point on. Here's some eggplant. They got a little bit of a slow start, um, but they're coming back. They've got a little bit of bug pressure. I've seen some Japanese beetles this year, and so um, that just kind of happens. But we try to come down in the mornings and either squish them or uh, put them in a bucket and then bring them up to the chickens. <laughs> Right here I have some dragon tongue bush beans. These I got from Baker Creek, and the main reason that I'm growing these this year is really just to seed save from them. Baker Creek tends to have really good quality seeds, but they're kind of expensive for the amount that you get, about $4 for, let's say, 40 seeds. And so I really just want to seed save from these this year. I'm sure we'll pick a few and eat them fresh, but this is mainly for seed saving so that I can have a good supply as well as maybe have some gifts for some of my friends. Here in this bed, I have some cinnamon basil, and then I have some ginger also for medicinal purposes, for tummy upsets and sore throats and things like that. 
We have a few French breakfast radishes here. We don't eat a ton of radishes, so I just plant them sort of as needed. And then I have some chamomile and we'll see how that goes. Here in this bed, it's completely full of celery. Now this is a variety called tango celery. Typically what you're gonna get when you get seed packets from a local store is a variety called Utah. And I have grown that in the past, but the stalks are not as big um, and you just end up getting more leaves than anything. But on this particular variety, it has really good stalks. You can see the stalks here look really nice and so I will preserve those by slicing them and dehydrating them and then I throw them into soups or any recipe that I'm using celery for but also the leaves don't throw away your leaves um, you can dehydrate these as well you grind them up you add equal parts of ground leaves and salt and then you have celery salt which really adds an amazing amount of flavor to a lot of dishes now we're moving on down to this side of the garden here. Just ignore all that laundry in the back. My kids hate it that I make them hang it out when we have a dryer. But hey, we're trying to consume less and uh, be more self-sustainable. Here I have some strawberries. Someone was just giving these away at an Azure standard pickup order. And I said, sure, I'll take them because no one else wanted them. Um, and I do have two zucchini plants. They don't look as nice as the other one over there, but uh, they are producing a little bit for me. These guys have not planted out yet. And then the majority of these pots here are a variety of pickling cucumber called homemade pickles. It's very disease resistant. And last year I had a lot of disease on my cucumbers. So I went with this variety. This year um, it's very prolific, produces a lot of fruit. And you can see here, I just have two tea posts and I just strung some baling twine between those to sort of make a makeshift trellis for these guys as they get big enough. Um, so these will be mainly for pickling and then also fresh eating. I decided not to do any salad type cucumbers this year that have a higher water content because really the pickling cucumbers are just fine and I figured I might as well get enough for pickling um, and not take up the space with other types of cucumbers. These beds here, I have five beds of Kennebec potatoes and I believe that these will be ready to harvest in about two weeks. And at the very end of this bed, I have some okra here. Now, unfortunately, this has a lot of pest pressure. These are Japanese beetles again. Um, and they're growing a bit slow because the blackberries back here, as well as the asparagus, are just starting to shade those. And so, um, unfortunately, I need to do a little bit of trimming maybe to give them a little more sunlight. Now, this area has been amazing this year. These are our blackberries. When we moved to this property, I went down to Lowe's at the end of the season and they had so much stuff on clearance. They had fruit trees, they had blueberries, they had blackberries. They also just had a ton of um, seasonal plants, um, perennials and things like that. And I was picking up some blueberry plants and the garden manager came over and asked me and said, hey, would you like to buy everything I have on clearance? And I said, well, that depends. <laughs> How much do you want for it? And so he came back with, uh, to me with a number and I said, sure, I'll take it. And it ended up being seven truckloads of plants and each one of these literally cost pennies. And so although we did have a lot of those perennial kind of decorative um, landscape ornamental type plants, we ended up with a ton of perennials um, that were edible. So you can see back here, these are all blackberries. My beds here are two foot by 16 foot. You can just see how beautiful they are and how many are on here. It's just staggering. We didn't nearly get this harvest last year. And I don't know if that was because of the soil. Um, if you've been watching my videos, you know that I had all of the soil brought in last year for the raised beds as well as the in-ground garden. And it was all contaminated with herbicide. And so this year has been a huge difference. Now that that herbicide has sort of I guess dissipated or broken down, I'm seeing such better results in this garden. So here I have two beds of Ozark strawberries. They're an ever-bearing um, variety, so we get them all throughout the summer. And then on the other side of the garden, I have two more strawberry beds that mirror these two. 
right here I have a bed of hot peppers. I have some jalapenos, I have some cayenne peppers, and I also have some sugar rush peach peppers in here. And I accidentally planted out these peppers. I was thinking that they were sugar rush peach, but I believe they are actually a sweet pickle pepper. Um, this is the variety that I will use to pickle peppers this year because we really love to have those on top of pizzas and in chilies and just kind of um, on a lot of our different um, foods that we eat. And this particular variety will pickle much better than a banana pepper. The walls are thicker and they stay much more crisp. I'm going to actually have to transplant these guys and move them out of here um, because they will cross pollinate with the hot peppers and then I'll end up getting a hot pickle pepper. <laughs> in this bed here, as well as this bed, I have a lot of tomato plants and beans. And in fact, these were all of the plants that I was using for herbicide tests this, this year. I basically was growing beans and tomatoes to see which areas of the garden were still highly contaminated. Uh, with herbicides so that I knew where to plant out basically mostly my tomatoes. That's what I was mostly concerned about But everything did so well. I have a hard I had a hard time just throwing these plants out You know that song by the pussycat dolls that says I hate this part right here Yeah, I can never kill plants even when I separate seedlings. I have a very hard time just tossing those to the side I always end up um, planting those and then I have way more than I need But that's okay. We'll have plenty to give to neighbors and friends and family so it'll all work out so when I am planning my garden out for the year, my main focus is on what food can I grow that's going to feed my family. And so there's always those fail-safe crops like white potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, and those things are easy because you just harvest them and bring them right into the house and they should store very well. Um, there's also green beans and corn and of course my favorite tomatoes. Um, so I know that I'm always going to plant those and I know exactly how I'm going to preserve those. But then you can get into different crops that you want to grow but it's hard to decide what you want to do with them because if you haven't been preserving them or are kind of new into it, you kind of have to fool around with different recipes and things like that. And so that can take some time. Like for instance, peppers. I love peppers and we love to eat them fresh. Um, we love to eat banana peppers with hummus and, you know, I will peck up. I will pickle those sweet pickle peppers. Um, the jalapenos will be for cowboy candy. Um, but. I just want to find more ways to preserve those because I feel like I'm actually very limited and peppers are one of the crops that I tend to grow a lot of and what I end up doing is mainly dehydrating a lot of those and then I'll throw them in soups and stews and things like that but I would love to learn different methods to preserve those. So that is a challenge when you are trying to get enough food for a year. Um, how can you preserve that? How can you use it? And what are the different methods and what recipes are going to be good? So I kind of struggle with that on some crops. Okay, now we're on the other side of the garden here. So I have some basil here mixed in with some tomatoes. These tomatoes, again, were more herbicide tests and I didn't have the heart to throw them away. Um, I did end up using a lot of the varieties that I don't like for these herbicide tests. I didn't want to use my Amish paste or brandy wine, which are my favorite. But this particular type of tomato plant is called a San Marzano. It is a paste type tomato. Um, what I don't like about this is that the fruit are very small and they are also plagued by blossom end rot. No matter how much calcium I give them, I will always get a ton of blossom end rot with this particular variety. Um, this one variety over here is called terracotta. And this I was actually given a free seed pack from one of the companies that I ordered from. And I mean, this thing is just loaded down. There's two of them here and they're just beautiful. I don't know what other varieties I have in here. They may mostly be San Marzano and maybe even a yellow plum or so. I also really don't like the yellow plum tomatoes. They tend to be mushy and they just don't have great flavor, but I'm trying them again because I don't have the heart to throw them out. And especially with what's going on in the world today, I would rather have more food than less. So this is just another bed of tomatoes here. Back here you can see I have sweet potatoes there and then strawberries and then more sweet potatoes back there with some white potatoes that kind of volunteer. They're kind of just growing up in there. 
And I do have a third bed of sweet potatoes there and another bed of cantaloupe with some zinnias. I have some watermelon in this bed with some cucumbers and we have sort of a trellis, it's hard to see, but it's just chicken wire. And then there's also watermelon in that far bed with something kind of fun in that bed. Let's go take a look. So this is called a butterfly pea plant and you don't grow this for the peas, you grow this for the flowers. It produces a blue purplish flower. And if you go on Amazon, you can look for um, blue butterfly pea powder. And what they do is they take the flowers and they dry them and powder them down and it's very expensive, but it makes a really awesome medicinal tea. But also what you can do with it is it works as a dye. So you can make really pretty drinks with this. And then if you add acid to it, like let's say you add some lemon juice to it, it takes that purpley tea and turns it pink. So it's kind of a novelty and kind of fun. So I just sort of sprinkled some in there, hoping that it would grow and come up this trellis here, but it's been a little slow and I'm not sure why. They look healthy enough, but maybe it just takes a while longer for these guys to grow, I'm not sure. And this bed here, as well as this bed here, I have some sweet peppers. I have some poblano, and I have some marconi and cubanel, some sweet pickle peppers. Oh, there's a big one right down in there, you can see. Yep, that's a nice one. And then this looks like a jalapeno. I, this looks like a jalapeno. I really messed up this year. I did not label things very well, and now I'm paying for it, unless it's a marconi, I mean, I don't know what these are starting out like. So maybe maybe it's a Marconi. Um, but my hope with the Cubanel and the Marconi is to take these guys and to stuff them and roast them in the oven. And I think that they'll be delicious. Okay, so that concludes the raised bed garden. Now let's talk about the in-ground garden. My rows are done in a standard market garden type way, meaning that they are 30 inches wide. And then my walkways, traditionally in a market garden, they would be 18 inches wide, but here they're 24 inches wide because I knew that I was gonna have kids in here. I knew Nate would be in here. Um, he's much bigger than I am. And I just wanted everybody to be comfortable as we were working down here. So in this first row, I have some volunteer zinnias that have popped up. I am not super impressed with these guys. They, they look pretty poor, um, but maybe as the season progresses, they'll get a little bit better. Now we did originally have some cabbage here, some golden acre cabbage, but we've since harvested that. And I've replaced it with soybeans. These are Midori soybeans. And I had about a hundred seeds left over from last year. And my daughter asked me to plant these for her. So I did. And right down here, I have some broccoli that's gone to seed. I'm gonna pull all of this and leave just one and save the seed from that. And I'll just continue this row of soybeans with a different variety called Chiba. I wasn't able to find the Midori um, variety again. So we'll go ahead with this other variety and try that. But we like to eat those straight in the pod um, with some soy sauce or also shelling them and putting them into um, something like a Chinese chicken salad, which is really delicious. So here is kind of interesting. Um, I have not had good luck with cauliflower. So this is a variety called Snowball Improved. What I have here is a bunch of this sort of purpley growth on it. It's, it's not a fungus or anything like that. I mean, it's part of the plant. So I'm not sure what's going on with this, but if you guys know and can tell me, that would be fantastic because I just don't know what's going on. And then at the end of this row, I have a black eyed California bean, which is a cow pea. So this is something that I will harvest in the pod once it's dried and it will be like a dry bean. And at the very end of some of my rows, I like to do uh, my bigger vining crops. So this is a Long Island cheese pumpkin. And then I have a few more. I have another one right there, and then I have two more. And so those will sort of just take up this area in here. And I've been kind of relaxed and not taking care of these weeds on the fence line here, but I need to do that. This Long Island cheese pumpkin was actually the original variety um, that New Englanders used to make pumpkin pie. So they are massive fruits. It's called Long Island cheese because it's sort of a short, squatty, 
kind of a pumpkin, but very, very big. So you get a lot of flesh from it. Um, the chickens love the seeds. I roast those in my oven and then I just puree it and I put it in the freezer in vacuum bags. Um, and then that will serve our needs for the year for that. And I'm actually seeing some squash bug eggs on this. I've been trying to come down and pick all these things off, but you can see right here, um, these are some squash bug eggs. I always try to bring gloves down to the garden because you never know what kind of bugs you'll have to squish. And honestly, if you're down here so much, it kind of gets gross. <laughs> Oh, and one last thing about the Long Island cheese pumpkin. I love these because these are more resistant than other varieties to squash vine borers. And if you've ever been plagued with borers, oh, it's like the worst feeling in the world. Last year, they got all of my plants and I came down and I cut open every stem, pulled every single one of them out. I, oh, I tried my hardest and I ended up saving some, but all of my Long Island cheese made it and produced wonderfully for me. So I will stick with this variety. Okay, in this row, I have an entire 70 foot row of cowpeas and I actually did two rows in here. So a total of 140 feet of cowpeas. They're called Ozark Razorback cowpeas and you harvest these when they're dry in the pod and you just shell them and you can eat them just like any other dried bean. But this particular crop is really good, especially when you're thinking about the end of the world. You can store it in mylar bags. It's drought resistant, disease resistant, pest resistant. I mean, you can see how beautiful these leaves are. Nothing's touching these guys right now. I love this crop. These are my tomatoes. I did two rows down this one 70 foot row and I did 35 tomatoes on each side. And you can see here that I'm using cattle panels with T-posts to trellis these. Um, I used to do the Florida weave method and it just, the weight of the tomato plants is so much that they weren't supported well. So you can see here, I'm just tying them as they grow with baling twine and it's working really well. Now 40 of these 70 plants are Amish paste tomatoes and these will be used for mainly preserving. The Amish paste tomatoes have a much lower water content than your other types of tomatoes, so you don't have to spend the time cooking them down to get the water content out, which is really nice. Also, the Amish paste do not get blossom end rot like I've experienced with San Marzano, and these guys get so big. They are two to three times the size of your typical Roma type tomato um, or paste tomato. So I love Amish paste. So these will be used for marinara sauce, diced tomatoes, crushed tomatoes, salsas. Um, I won't make tomato paste and I probably won't do ketchup unless I get really excited about something. Um, both of those take quite a bit of effort and you don't get a huge amount from the amount of tomatoes that you're processing. Now down this side, I have other varieties of tomatoes. I have sun gold tomatoes, which is a hybrid. My oldest son asked me to grow these for him. So I have a few of those in here. I believe this is an Amish paste. Here I have one called a German Johnson. That was also a new seed to me this year. And then we have some brandy wine, which are my favorite. And you can tell that these are brandy wine because they have a bit of a different leaf than your typical tomato plant. Okay, the next row, I had this echinacea or coneflower here. Um, this is a medicinal herb that I use for an immune boosting tincture for when we are feeling sick and we need a little bit of a boost in trying to fight something off. I thought that this died last year in the herbicide soil, but it popped back, which is amazing because there really was nothing left of this. But down this row, I have three rows actually <laughs> of Blue Lake 274 bush beans. I love the bush beans. I don't have to trellis them. And these guys, after you harvest, they will keep putting on flowers and keep producing for you. And what's funny is you can see they look really good here and they look really good down the end of the row. But I have a pocket here that is just ugh, a little small. And I think that this is actually in some soil that still had a bit of herbicide content. You can see this guy here is leaves are a little bit bubbly, a little bit distorted, but this is what I faced last year with every single one of my bean plants. Um, this guy won't produce anything, but 
this whole row of beans will be plenty for us for the year. Um, I also have some up at the house that have already been preserved from last year that we still have. And so this is so much better than last year. I am just so grateful. I will sacrifice this small little uh, 10 foot area um, and the rest of my plants look fantastic. So I'm totally happy with that. Now down this next row, I have onions. And these are onion sets here that I bought from Lowe's. And what's interesting is that in South Carolina, we need short day onions, but Lowe's only sells long day onions. And long day onions need a certain amount of hours of sun per day to bulb up. And so I planted these um, and you can see they just, they don't look great. Um, and so I'm not super impressed with these, but I did start some onions from seed this year. These are all short day varieties and look at how great these look. Um, I did a yellow Granex, a PRP something, I'll have to look that one up, and then also a red burgundy. So I think I will be starting my onions from seed from now on and I won't be doing the onion sets. Now short day onions don't store well so unfortunately I will have to either dry these or can these. Um, I will try to store them as long as I can, but I'll have to find out a different method to preserve these guys. Now here are some peppers. I thought these were all bell peppers, but lo and behold, that is not a bell pepper. Um, so again, make sure you label your things. But down here, you can see that I actually have a purple beauty pepper in there ready to be harvested. Now these peppers were planted even before the ones in the raised bed. And unfortunately, they're just a lot smaller. They're not as happy as the other peppers, but maybe they'll bounce back. Maybe it's some of the herbicide stuff, but I'm not seeing a lot of disfiguration in the leaves or anything. So we'll just have to wait and see. Now to finish up this garden tour, um, I have nine rows of sweet corn here. It's a variety called Who Gets Kissed Sweet Corn. And um, it did really well for me last year, and so we went ahead and did it again this year. We will mainly freeze this um, on the cob. We'll also blanch it and freeze just the kernels, and then we will also can some, depending on the amount of harvest that we get. Now, I did make a mistake here, and I planted some sunflowers here. Those are mammoth gray sunflowers. Nate loves sunflower seeds as well as the kids do. And I wanted to plant a variety that had really massive seeds. My black oil sunflower seeds were smaller last year. And so I went with this variety this year, but unfortunately it is shading my last row of corn. You can see here, they're all very small. Maybe those might be up to my mid calf. Whereas this row here is up to, gosh, I mean higher than my torso. So you can see the difference that sunshine makes. So when you're planting out your garden, make sure you have a good amount of sun. It'll be a world of difference for your plants, um, depending on how much sun you get. I actually thought about cutting some of those down, but uh, it's so hard for me to kill plants. So we'll see, time will tell what we decide to do and how much of a harvest we will get. Now for some exciting news. Um, so what I've learned from last year and this year is that our four strawberry beds are not big enough for us to have enough to preserve. Now we can come down and eat till our heart's content, but I don't have enough for the jams and jellies and things of that nature. So I have asked Nate for next year for him to put in a dedicated strawberry patch for me. And I will end up taking these plants, relocating them over there, or maybe just relocating some runners and things. And then I will have four more beds in the in-ground garden that I can plant out. I've also asked him for a dedicated sunflower garden um, so that we can have the seeds for us and for the livestock. And then two more things. One thing that I've asked him for is a patch for dent corn. So dent corn and sweet corn are different. Um, dent corn is more for your cornmeal and sweet corn is more for fresh eating. So you can't plant those next to each other because they'll cross pollinate and neither one of them will be what you want them to be because you're eating the seed. So, I don't have the room to do another area of dent corn in this garden, so I've asked him for another area for dent corn, and then I was just thinking, popcorn. I would love to do popcorn. So I'm gonna let him know when he gets home from work tonight that I want a popcorn area too. Now he has rolled his eyes at me on a few of those requests, um, but he's a good sport. And you know, he loves to eat this food just as much as the rest of us, and so 
I think next year, I think you're going to see some of those new garden areas. Hey but guys, it's nighttime and Nate is finally home from work. He's working in his home office now and we're going to go in and share the news with him. So come along, let's see how that goes. Hi. How you doing? Good. <laughs> So I was in my garden today and I did a little garden tour and I was thinking next year mm -hmm. so that we can get like the best production that I could get um, a strawberry bed and an extra sunflower bed because I think that'd be really good for the animals. The and animals. Uh -huh. and then, um, you know, because it's really good for the goats when they're in milk. That's yeah, really good. And then, <laughs> And then I also thought um, about some, I wanted some dent corn since the corn can pollinate, cross pollinate. I really wanted a spot for dent corn. Because mm -hmm. we need that. Uh huh. And I wanted popcorn too, so a whole nother area. Sure. What do you popcorn. think about <laughs> What do you think about that? You know, <laughs> do you know how much labor goes into your popcorn? Yeah, but yeah. what if you can't get it at the store? Yeah, because we need the popcorn. Yeah, do you like popcorn? Mm, I love popcorn. The kids like popcorn. Yeah. Okay. All it's right. It's going to be the tastiest popcorn of that. All right. So we'll get that done. See? I told yeah. you it would all work out just fine. Mm -hmm. 